For those of you who have not met Cold Quanta's CEO, Bo Ewald, I'd like to give you a little of his background. Like most of us, Bo is in his home office and will be transmitting at approximately 8,000 feet from somewhere in the Rockies of Montana. He has a long history of leading technology organizations, government projects, and industry efforts. Before joining Cold Quanta, Bo was the president of D-Wave Systems and a founding member of the Quantum Industry Coalition. Prior to D-Wave, Bo was the CEO of SGI and the president of the supercomputing leader Cray Research. He started his career at Los Alamos National Laboratory, where he was the youngest director to run the computing and communications division and where he met Richard Feynman. Bo has served on the board of directors for several public and private companies and was appointed to the President's Information Technology Advisory Council by both the Clinton and Bush administrations. It is my pleasure to turn it over to Bo. Great, thanks Diane, and it looks like I'm magically unmuted, <clears throat> so hopefully you can hear me. Um, as uh, many of you know, I'm not a very good public speaker and I'm this is worse, <laughs> but uh, appreciate your patience and uh, bearing with us because the topic is really interesting. So originally, these were gonna be a series of seminars that we were going to do in Washington, D.C. to introduce people around the D.C. area to uh, things quantum and uh, cold quanta in particular. But given the state of the world, we've changed uh, to this format. And again, appreciate your joining us and I know uh, having had notes from a few people ahead of time that a couple of you actually have the virus and uh, so we would thank you during your convalescent period for listening in as well. So we're, we hope to be able to put your convalescence to a little bit of uh, learn a few new things here as we go. So long way of saying really appreciate your joining and being with us today. I think you'll find the uh, technology very interesting and again uh, as a reminder if you have questions you can send those in as we go along try to answer a few at the end. And if this all works, uh, we will go to the next slide. Okay, hopefully <laughs> you can still hear me and we're uh, back in business. Uh, so, you know, to, to start at kind of a high level and then we'll drop down lower. Um, I've been in the computing business and graphics and high technology for a long, long time, as Diane said. But it appears to me that we're really at the start of kind of the third wave of the information age. And that the first wave was electronics and it started in the early 1900s, but really got rolling in the 40s and 1950s when transistors and integrated circuits were invented and developed. And that electronics age really led to the digital age. And, um, you know, and basically what we did there, we, we were able to harness electrons and that led to radios and televisions and computers and watches and cell phones and hosts of other things. So that to me, that the digital age, if you will, or digital wave was the, uh, was the start. And then, oh, 25 or 30 years later, people started being able to harness photons, light, and created lasers and then fiber optics to be able to use in transmission. And that led to a whole host of new products and things we were able to do, communicate better, and who would have ever imagined that you could listen to music because of a laser or have your eyes operated on because of a laser. So now we're at the relative start of what I think is going to be the third wave of the information age, and that's the quantum wave. And, it, this, the, and it, there are many different technologies that you can use to harness things quantum, but we're gonna tell you about one that we think actually has the broadest reach, and that is uh, using cold atoms. And, and the quantum wave will build on the electronics wave and on photonics. So we, in our case, we use photons to control atoms, and we use electronics to control the, the, fo the uh, lasers that we use. So, uh, with that as background, again, just big picture stuff, would appreciate your comments on this, kind of, you know, this is the 100,000 foot view, but I do think we're in, you know, 20 years, you're, you're going to be amazed at the things that we build on top of electrons and photons, then using quantum techniques based around atoms. 
So things we'll talk about are shown here. First, we'll uh, give a little bit of background about quantum matter, then what can you do with it, and then, of course, a summary. So quantum matter, the ideas for it are nearly 100 years old. And about 100 years ago, an Indian physics professor, Professor Bose, sent Einstein a paper that uh, had a, sort of extended the, the then growing field of quantum statistics and quantum mechanics. And he theorized that if you could make atoms of a particular element um, very cold, that they would coalesce into a new form of matter, quantum matter, that came to be called Bose-Einstein condensate. Einstein was very interested in the idea, published Bose's paper, and then they worked together and extended the idea. So it was a great, it was a theory about this new form of matter, quantum matter, but it was just a theory. And it took another 75 years or so for electronics to, to uh, continue, and then for lasers to come into being to harness photons. And Steve Chu, who's shown in the upper right of this picture, uh, who some of you may know as uh, Energy uh, Secretary Chu, as well as being professor of physics and a whole collection of other great things that he's done. About 75 years later, he and other colleagues showed how you could use lasers to cool and control atoms. And Steve and group were awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1997. And then building upon that, Eric Cornell and Carl Wyman and uh, others in Germany, uh, uh, Eric and Carl were at the University of Colorado. They created the first quantum matter, again, using um, lasers to stop the motion of atoms and then get them very cold and created the first Bose-Einstein condensate. And a picture of it is in the lower right of this slide. And they were awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2001. So that was a huge breakthrough, uh, th great theoretical work and, and creating an experiment to demonstrate it. But it was, again, proving what uh, Einstein and Bose had theorized some 80 years before. Then Dana Anderson, who is, is and was in the physics department and at the Jilla Institute at the University of Colorado, started a company called Cole Quanta in 2007. And Dana is an applied physicist, and his idea was building upon the work that his colleagues had done to create families of products to let others create this new form of matter, this quantum matter, and to enable people to do you know, basic research on quantum matter. And uh, that really was how Cole Quanta got started and has continued until uh, just recently, where now we believe we're far enough along that we can actually create families of products with others typically around what we call the quantum core. So that's how uh, we've evolved sort of to this point from theory uh, into practice. And now, now what can we do with it? And sort of at the core of the idea here with quantum atomics and cold atoms is that we use, as we uh, try to show in this uh, picture, is that we use lasers uh, to control atoms. And we can, by stopping their motion, we can control, can, can cool them to with, in, you know, a few nano Kelvin of absolute zero. So probably the coldest place in the measured universe so far. And we can control atoms one at a time or uh, thousands and billions of them in a cloud. And the technology is now becoming uh, more routine, and we'll show you how it's uh, been in space now. It's had a couple of trips to space and operating in space, and enables a broad set of products to be able to be created. And the next uh, slide, this one, uh, shows sort of what is at the heart of uh, everything that we do. So this may not look like a computer, and it may not look like a GPS-like unit, and it may not look like a radio frequency receiver, but it can be all of those things. And what it is, is a glass cell that's about an inch by an inch by a couple of inches high, and uh, very high quality, uh, highly sealed uh, uh, glass cell. And if you use your imagination a little bit, on the uh, one end of the glass, 
uh, we have we want to have uh, this be a vacuum. So on one end of the glass, we uh, put a vacuum pump, very high quality vacuum pump, to evacuate the glass. And on the other end, we also have a source of atoms. And uh, the atoms that we tend to use, that we use one element uh, at a time. Uh, the atoms we use tend to be those sort of on the left side of the periodic table. And so things like rubidium or cesium and, uh, are what we use. So imagine glass cell, uh, vacuum pump on one side, and a source of atoms on the other side. And then uh, once we have it evacuated, and once we put atoms, say of rubidium, into it, we can then shine lasers through the uh, glass and manipulate the atoms. So now it's gonna be your turn to help a little bit and uh, it'll give you a little chance to stretch and use your imagination and it's a little silly, but I would ask you to play along uh, since we're not in person. But if you would uh, uh, take your two hands and your 10 fingers, we're gonna make believe that we're inside that little cell and we're gonna make believe that our 10 fingers, or however many we have, are uh, atoms. And so if you would wiggle those around, and the reality is that the atoms in the room that you're listening in, or in this little cell until we do something to them, well, they're moving around at like 600 miles an hour. So your fingertips are moving at something like 600 miles an hour. Now we're gonna hit those fingertips with lasers to slow their motion and eventually stop their motion. And what's gonna happen is that if we can get them cold enough, your fingers are going to join, going to interlace with each other, and your two hands are gonna to come together. And we've just gone from thousands of fingers of atoms uh, being stopped and controlled by lasers, and they now collapse and coalesce into this new quantum matter. And so that's how, that, and that quantum matter is a Bose-Einstein condensate. And that really, again, goes back to the, the theorization of about 100 years ago. But we're able to do that now routinely in this device. And over the next few months, we're going to make a Bose-Einstein condensate machine or a quantum matter machine available on the cloud. So you too, if you wanna do it beyond using your fingers and your hands, uh, you can actually create your own quantum matter and, and experiment with it. But then, if you took those same uh, 10 fingers and if instead of them being uh, uh, atoms, if you laid, if you uh, spread your fingers a little bit and then made them perpendicular to each other, you get sort of a two dimension. And I'm sorry, I'm probably talking through my hands because I'm doing it myself. But if you sp spread your fingers a little bit, make them parallel and then overlay them at a 90 degree angle and now make believe your fingers are lasers in each of, and you create sort of a checkerboard pattern. In each of those gaps, we can place a single atom and we can populate the entire checkerboard with atoms. And we again can then further manipulate each of those atoms with another set of lasers. And what we have then done is we're able to turn each of those atoms in each of those checkerboard squares between your fingers, we can turn each of those into a qubit. And we've thus created a quantum computer in this same glass cell, the same quantum core. And then if we were to take those that, you know, so now take your fingers <laughs> in the checkerboard pattern, and stack them, create, you can't do this physically, but if you were able to stack multiple uh, 2D lattices like that on top of each other, like, like a stack of pancakes, you've created one of the techniques then to be able to create an atomic clock, the most, most accurate clock in the universe. And clocks so accurate that in fact, you can uh, probably only lose one or two seconds in the lifetime of the universe. So, and again, around the same sort of core technology. And then uh, this one, I don't have a very good way to say it, <laughs> um, but if you could, in, within this, now we're still in the same glass core. If you put your two index fingers together and we have a way of splitting an atom in a quantum manner, not the nuclear way, and take your two fingers and sort of rotate them in a circle and have them 
intersect each other and then come back around to the starting point and have them continue doing that. If we do that within the glass cell, we're able to detect motion very accurately, whether it be changes in X, Y, or Z directions or rotational directions. So, so with that, we then believe that we can uh, create devices that can uh, not only compute, but also be very accurate at timekeeping, positioning, and we won't get into the, uh, with our simple demonstration with your fingers, get into radio frequency sensing, but you can do the same thing within the same core device. So it's amazing. I mean, this if you look at this very um, highly polished and, and exquisite piece of glass, it doesn't look like a computer. It doesn't look like a clock. Uh, it's very small. It's very rugged. Within the glass cell, we're operating at temperatures that are in the micro and nano Kelvin range, but just outside of it, uh, it's at room temperature. So it's really quite amazing all of the things that we can do with this. So that's at the core of everything that we do. And based around that one piece of uh, that one glass cell, again, using light lasers to manipulate the atoms, this is, this is how we do quantum computing. And so you can see at the base now of this, the picture on the left, uh, we have an array of atoms. They're now qubits. And we can program them and manipulate them using lasers. And we can connect them together. We can create gates and perform operations on them and then read out the results at the end of the calculation cycle. And then secondly, I was trying, this was one I was trying to explain by rotating your fingers. But this is how we create a gyroscope and an accelerometer using the same technology in that we, quote, split the atom, but again, split it in a, um, in a quantum mechanical sense rather than the nuclear energy sense. And we can detect very, very um, slight changes in location and position and a collection of other things as well. And then this one is kind of the wildest one. Um, but if we use, again, lasers, and we have uh, collections or pools of atoms in this cube again, we can use lasers to actually create little circuits. And we have, again, the, the green blobs that you see are collections of atoms. And then we can use those atoms to sort of run them through um, something that is, that is a quantum version of a transistor and a circuit, if you will. And we can do that over and over again. So we can create specialized circuits for particular things, again, using uh, particular applications using these atoms. So it's really wild technology, and it has lots and lots of applications. And so the potential applications that are shown in the uh, picture on the left, we think that we can, uh, and I'll just uh, go through these fairly quickly, and we'll come back and look at a couple of them. But we think that we can create detectors of radio frequency signals that are hundreds to thousands of times more sensitive than other devices. We talked about very accurate positioning and clocks, uh, gravity sensing, qubits, and on and on and on. It's really quite amazing. And when you go to build quantum devices, as we're going to say in a second, when people say quantum, they, the word computing usually is silent behind that. And that's the first application of things quantum. But if you look down the list here, you'll see many, many. So I'm on the, the picture on the right side of the screen and the list of potential applications here are shown. And then horizontally, we show some of the different technologies that you can use to implement them. And part of what is so appealing about what we're doing, and I think gives us this idea that we're at the third wave of the information age, is that these cold atoms, sometimes we'll call them neutral atoms, have so many different applications. And if we look at photonic approaches, they have some, and superconducting approaches to building things quantum has been around by far the longest. Um, our, our friends at IBM have been working on superconducting quantum computers and uh, uh, D-Wave and Google and Rigetti, but the tech, that technology may scale a little bit into uh, imaging, but probably mostly computing. And then quantum dots are another approach, and Microsoft is working on topological. But when we 
try to do a fair analysis of what technologies have the most scale in creating Prince Quantum, we come to the conclusion that in fact, cold atoms and, and maybe our cousins, uh, people who work on ions, uh, have probably the most scale beyond computing. So long way of, long winded way of saying that there are many, many things quantum beyond computing. And we attempt to show that with this little iceberg chart. Again, when most people talk about, use the word quantum, uh, the word computing is there, but it's silent uh, behind it. And, um, but quantum positioning and timekeeping and signal processing and communications. So we're gonna talk a little bit about two of the things that we've been working on. And uh, we'll start, however, with something that has been demonstrated in space. And about uh, three years ago, JPL wanted to test the creation of quantum matter, create a, a BEC in space. And uh, so we worked with them and created what was called Cold Atom Laboratory, CAL number one. And it was launched uh, in 2018 and installed on the International Space Station. And uh, science, and it operated for about 18 months continuously. You could access it uh, <laughs> via the cloud or maybe above the clouds, and you could run it from the ground or from the International Space Station. And so people created and experimented with creating BECs uh, in a microgravity environment, and in fact, achieved nano Kelvin temperatures in doing that, and many other really interesting things. Then next, JPL and NASA said it would be really interesting to create a quantum sensor. And it looks like these cold atoms have the ability to be able to do that. Let's work together and create a quantum sensor, a gravimeter, a quantum gravimeter, and install it in, on the space station as well. So we worked with them and did that. And, and uh, the picture in the upper right is a SpaceX rocket that launched Cal-2 uh, in December from the Cape. And this is astronaut Christina Koch in the lower right, who's installing Cold Atom Lab number two on the space station. This picture was from February, I think, just before she came back home. And uh, so long way of saying that the first iteration of uh, our devices in space, our systems in space, were to create a BEC machine. And now second is a quantum sensor, a gravimeter. Uh, that is currently on this on the space station. And the point to that is that around that little glass cell, the technologies that we surround it with are, it's rugged itself, and the technologies we surround it with are also very rugged. So this is a technology that you can use in standalone computers, or you can put in rockets, and you can fly it on the space station or aircraft, and eventually in cars and, and a whole collection of places from there. So technology is rugged and uh, has lots of legs <laughs> to go many other places, okay? So let's talk a little bit about quantum sensing then. And you've seen the picture on your left. And we'll highlight two things that we've been working on. One of those is what I call a quantum positioning system. Uh, so terminology simple, similar to uh, GPS, but in this case, we're uh, doing it quantum. And then we'll talk just briefly about quantum signal processing. And the work that we've done here has been uh, partially funded by various government R&D projects. And we'll show you what some of those look like. So uh, first, in, the, in today's world, we use GPS in everything. <laughs> everything we do involves GPS, not just your cell phone or your car, but it's used uh, in the nation, the world's really controlling the power grids, the timing is involved, uh, you know, banks and stock exchanges, internet time, and a uh, whole, you know, whole collection of things I won't attempt to go through. All of these things far beyond what we typically think of with GPS as, you know, giving us, uh, bringing up Google Maps or one of the other map services and telling us how to get someplace. So it's been great, it's enabled so many things, uh, it's enabled us to do so many things that we couldn't have otherwise done. But the reality of it is that it has turned out to be fairly easy to be jammed and worse is spoofed. So in the lower right uh, corner of this picture, 
you'll see some devices that are just simple GPS jammers <laughs> that you can buy you know, on sale for $119 and it will kill uh, GPS coverage within you know, some distance of where you are. And that's one thing is to you know, keep other people from knowing where you are, but the technologies can also be used to deny GPS services. And that, that's serious for many, many applications and worse is the spoofing part. So if you look at this next slide, we just collected a few of the things where people have um, uh, been able to not just deny GPS services, but also spoof them. So the headline in the upper left, and you can look all of these up as you would like, but the headline in the upper left was from a Black Hat security conference last uh, fall. And uh, at that conference, a young fellow demonstrated how using, how, you know, using kind of off-the-shelf equipment for a few hundred dollars, he was able to take control of an autonomous vehicle and have it change lanes and then drive off the road. And you can see in the lower left that, that there are applications now, uh, fake GPS locations, and in the upper right, uh, is a little uh, commentary that came from work that was done by, amongst others, a study at the University of Texas that showed that over the last two years, using unclassified sources, they were able to identify about 10,000 10, 10, cases of uh, GPS spoofing, where ships uh, that were clearly in the ocean, their GPS showed they were on land and a whole collection of other so long way of saying that uh, GPS that we know and love and use every day has some vulnerabilities. And those vulnerabilities have impact not just on military things, but also commercial applications in shipping and in autonomous vehicles and with our own uh, GPS navigation. So what we believe is that we can create a QPS that uh, can operate in a GPS denied environment that isn't spoofable and that is private and secure so that if you don't want anybody else to know where you are, you don't have to let them know that. And it's again based around this idea of using cold atoms for timekeeping and for very accurate uh, detecting of changes of position. And then also other sensors we can use uh, to make them even more accurate. It's very early days here. Um, it's, you're, you know, we're not ready to uh, be installing these in our cars yet, but, uh, but those days will come during your lifetimes. So if you're going to build a quantum positioning system and a standalone device, you'd want it to be able to be self-contained. There are size, weight, and power requirements that you need to meet. And fundamentally, you also need a starting position. And so we have to be able to uh, figure out how to do that. But when you turn your QPS on, you need to be able to establish a good starting position from other sources. Three major parts to it are a clock, an accelerometer to keep track of X, Y, and Z changes, a gyroscope to keep track of angular changes. And then for certain applications, a gravimeter could help and then a magnetometer could help as well. So where, are we in, these, uh, in this area? So these are projects that we've worked on, most of them government funded, many of them from the US and, and uh, a couple from the UK and other places as well. Um, and of those components that we talked about, on the clock side, we're now working on our fifth clock project. And the bottom one that you can see here is to, to uh, create a quantum clock with GPS-like performance and very rapid startup so that if there were a GPS outage, you would be able to have a clock. It was very accurate and started almost instantaneously. And the one above that is a quantum clock for space emissions. On accelerometers, we've developed and demonstrated a three axis accelerometer in a fairly portable unit. And then we also have two gyroscope projects that are going on now. So when we get more of these projects a little further along, I think you'll see devices like this um, uh, in various applications, whether they be uh, prototype applications at the start, but combine the components to be able to create prototype devices that will lead 
to production devices, both for commercial and military applications as well. Again, concern is GPS denied environment. And gravimeter, we've already talked about. Uh, we currently have the quantum gravimeter deployed on the ISS. And uh, magnetometer, we haven't worked on that yet, but uh, can. And then integrating it all, uh, we have a, a three projects that we've worked on to take various parts and integrate them into a package that can be uh, driven or flown or, or uh, be on a ship or go into space. And one of those is a new program that we've just won. And uh, hopefully moving through all this COVID stuff won't get things too goofed up. We and our partners have won. I won't say much more about it, about the partners. I won't say any more about the partners yet until it gets all wrapped up. But this is a second project that we have won uh, in this arena. And the idea is to be able to create uh, an inertial system based on atomic clock an inertial sensor that you can actually fly and demonstrate uh, over uh, the not too distant future. So stay tuned. This is something that's coming over the next couple of years in this program. And then if we switch just quickly to quantum signal processing, we believe that we can create signal processing sensors, RF sensors is a way to think about it, that are hundreds to thousands of times more sensitive than today's uh, analog digital devices. And the most advanced RF receivers today use cryo-cooling. So much like the superconducting uh, quantum computers, uh, the advanced RF receivers use the same sort of cooling. And this is one such device from, from a, uh, a, a space mission that's shown here on the right. But we think that cold, atom, cold atoms will allow us to receive a wide range of frequencies. We can detect, we think, weaker signals than you can with other technologies, like a hundred or a thousand times more faint than other technologies, and where those signals come from, and eventually stealth communications and low power, ruggedized compact systems. And we think uh, that will enable, you can see the list there of radar, radio, and uh, ability to locate sources of signals, and eventually some version of something like a quantum radar, not, not like what most people have been talking about with quantum radar, but a different approach to it. And so we've been working on a prototype in this arena to detect the origins of signals. So, um, so I think stay tuned again. I think you'll see collections of things, uh, families of products coming uh, in this arena. And, and just one uh, chart sort of to show you why there's so much potential here. And so this is, again, a picture of our Bose-Einstein condensate, the quantum matter. And the reality is a single photon can disrupt that quantum matter. So you can detect, and detect may not quite be the right word yet, but, but you can tell that a single photon has uh, you know, melted that quantum matter. And so you can detect a, a single photon and that is far more sensitive than, than most other uh, potential uh, technologies could. So long way of saying that there, this isn't just talk. The technology itself has tremendous legs to be able to create um, sensing devices that are extremely, sensing and signal processing devices that are extremely accurate. Okay. Then now let's switch and talk uh, lastly about quantum computing. And so this is sort of, we don't have a quantum computer yet. We can demonstrate in the other devices. But if one were to build a quantum computer out of cold atoms, and I'll say a little bit more about that uh, toward the, at, at the end, this is how you would do it. So you see our picture from before where uh, we have a two-dimensional lattice or a two-dimensional array of atoms that are qubits. In our case, we turn them into qubits and then we manipulate them with lasers, uh, another set of lasers to uh, set their initial values, create the gates, connect the gates, and then operate and then read out the results. And in our case, every atom is identical, so we don't have the struggles that some other folks do in trying to uh, uh, create qubits that are identical. That's certainly the case in the superconducting world. And um, we, again, can operate these, these devices. We believe if you picked any of those atoms in the first generation of 
quantum computers that are based on uh, superconducting technologies, an atom typically, or I'm sorry, a qubit is typically, typically connected to its nearest neighbors. So you can have, you can create gates that have, you know, three or four uh, qubits. And in our case, we think that as we move the technology forward, you'll be able to connect a qubit to its nearest neighbors and those to their nearest neighbors. So you're going to be able to create gates that have up to 20 to 30-ish uh, uh, qubits in them. So much more complicated structures. And we believe the technology also will scale very well for us to scale it up. In this uh, case, this is a 10 by 10 array representation of what a 100 qubit machine would look like. But to scale it up, uh, we, if we had a 100 by 100 array, uh, using the same technology, it looks like, you know, you can scale it into the thousands of qubits using technology that exists today. So that is sort of at the base of how quantum computer works. And then this is uh, the same picture that we've seen from before of the lattice and then interrogating it with, um, with lasers and being able to program it. So sort of the last statement here on using uh, cold atoms for for quantum computing is that the, the, the number one thing is that our qubits will be identical. The atoms are identical. We have some other challenges uh, that we have to overcome on the getting the uh, sort of the quote, making sure the quality of our lasers and all the rest are, are great. But there's so many advantages in terms of uh, qubit quality. Uh, laser cooling gets us down into the uh, micro and nano Kelvin range. So we're, our machines are you know, thousands of times colder than the superconducting approach. And that's all good uh, for operating in quantum regimes. And we think they're going to be quite scalable. And again, as we talk, the technology is one. So you can read all of these things. I won't um, uh, take you through anymore. That They're very low, low power. We can, we think we'd be able to build a quantum computer that probably uses less than 10 kilowatts. And so, uh, with that, I would just uh, maybe say, stay tuned, uh, stay tuned like tomorrow, stay tuned. And uh, I think you'll see an announcement coming out that uh, some company that we might be well acquainted with has been awarded uh, a new program to create a scalable quantum computer that over the next 40 months or so would scale to thousands of qubits. Uh, with better connectivity between qubits and uh, running a real world problem. So, so stay tuned like tomorrow, stay tuned. And then uh, lastly, uh, just we've, we've said all of these things, but basically quantum technology will deliver, you know, huge improvements in performance or sensitivity. And, you know, we just kind of try to say a hundred to a thousand since most people until COVID came along didn't know what exponential really meant. Um, when people today talk about quantum, the computing part is usually there, but the reality is there are going to be whole new families of products, just like electronics enabled revolutions of products and just like lasers and photons enabled revolutions of products. We think that the technology we have is the best one to scale forward. And we have a lot of experience doing it. We have systems that we've deployed and we have uh, great prototypes that we're working on. And uh, all of these things are again, built around that single quantum core. So with that, uh, we're at the uh, end. And I think we are uh, have seen that it looks like we've been answering some questions and I think you all have uh, sent some questions in as well. And it looks like, I don't know if you can all see what I can, but we, we've had uh, 260 some participants and it looks like there may be still were some waiting to get in. So, so would say uh, thanks so much for listening. Really appreciate it. Uh, we're glad to try to answer questions either this way or, you know, send us an email and we're glad to uh, do it that way. And hopefully very soon we'll be out there and can see you in person. So thanks. And I'll turn it back to you, Diane. Thank you, Bo. So we do have a couple of questions. I don't know that we will be able to answer all of them. You all have been fabulous at, at sending in some interesting questions. I have one for the attendees though. Um, if you'd like to put a shout out to um, what country you're listening from, I know we have some listeners from India and from Germany. I haven't um, 
spotted any other names that I recognize in trying to go through the 256 uh, attendees. But uh, so we've got Canada, Puerto Rico, uh, um, Austria, they're firing in now France, <laughs> UK, France. Excellent. Well, we're all in this together, as everybody's been saying in the uh, media. And it is awesome to have you all um, listening in on our first webinar. And we will be continuing to hold additional webinars. So please watch um, our website. And since you all listened in on this one, you'll certainly get an invitation to the next one, which will be, I believe it's April 22nd. So please be watching for that. So let me uh, see if I can read through a couple of these questions, Bo, and hopefully we don't stump you here. Um, so could you please elaborate on the statement, a microwave photon, oh, no, that's no one, there's, that's when they're still answering, sorry. <laughs> if you are saying it enables stealth communication, do you assume known as using the same system because otherwise they would also be able to sense it, wouldn't they? Yeah, so that's a, uh, that's a longer uh, answer than we probably, and a more detailed answer than we have time for today and maybe is a good um, topic for a future uh, seminar. But basically what, what we can do using that same technology uh, around the, the quantum core is that we can uh, create, uh, and I'm sorry, I'm using my hands, but <laughs> we can create sort of a um, cigar-shaped uh, cloud of atoms, and we can uh, have entangled photons that we can, we can generate uh, by photons that are entangled. And then that is the basis for a way to be able to communicate uh, relatively low bandwidth, short, you know, just a few bits at the start uh, using entangled photons uh, that would be uh, uh, more or less undetectable by others. And you could also tell if someone were trying to uh, find them. So we believe that the technology has the ability to be able to uh, send relatively, not relatively, very short messages that probably wouldn't be able to be detected, uh, uh, you know, probably lower than sort of background noise levels. And that's a whole, there's, you know, there are uh, days that we could talk about that. Okay, we'll try this one. What are the advantages of a neutral atom system for these applications in comparison to an ion-based system? Yeah, that's a great question. So the, uh, the ion-based systems so far have mostly been demonstrated for quantum computing. So uh, our friends I and Q are one of the companies that build those, and, and there have been many others in research projects, not many, but several others in research projects going on. And when the ion, uh, and they're created using a technology at the core, is an ion trap, and we actually build ion traps ourselves. Uh, you know, as you uh, I'm sure the person who asked the question knows, but for others, uh, you know, ions are atoms, they're charged atoms. And so the technology around operating on them and manipulating them of using lasers and high vacuums is all the same or very similar. So in fact, we've taken our technology and have built ion traps for others. Um, and so far with the way that the ion trap machines work are that when you Put the qubits together, they tend to look like, uh, the way I think about them is a string of pearls, where they're connected in a one-dimensional array. And I think INQ has had, at least has talked publicly about having 13 of them connected like this string of pearls. And then I believe of those 13, the 11, the end ones aren't uh, useful fully. But the 11 in the middle are. So I, that, and they, there may be uh, more than that, but that was the last that I saw. Uh, so what that leads to then is, uh, and I should say one other thing, a, a good advantage of those is I believe that all of those qubits are basically interconnected. And you could think of it as kind of an all to all connectivity. So uh, sort of one dimensional 
connectivity, all to all connect, all to all connections, similar technology to what we're doing, and to scale up within one of the ion traps, you may be able to have, you know, 50 to maybe 100 ions. And to go beyond that, then you'll probably need some connection and another ion trap. And when you get beyond, say, 100 or 200, you'll probably need another and another. But, you'll, but there are big advantages, in some cases, on the connectivity between the qubits. In our case, we start with a two-dimensional array. And uh, we showed you the example there that uh, a, a 10 by 10 array of qubits gives you 100 qubits. And the technology exists to further uh, scale up. And again, this <laughs> stay tuned for the announcement, like tomorrow, of this uh, new program that we've won. Uh, what you'll hear is that we, in fact, have promised that the technology should scale to the thousands of qubits over the next roughly three years or so. So we think that I entrap a great approach. I think it'll be terrific at some problems. And I think our approach will turn out that we'll have many more qubits and we'll end up being able to have, let people sort of create like quantum functional units or something like that, that have 20 or 30 qubits involved. So. Um, and I'll probably, I could go on and on, but I'll try to cut it off. <laughs> so here's another question for you. Can you discuss the specs of the BEC online experimental apparatus in a little more detail? Um, I can really just point you to a future seminar. So uh, I, think, I think maybe the next of these webinars that we're going to do is about the technology, and maybe the one after that will be about and I may have this a little mixed up, but I think it will be about BEC and then BEC on the cloud. So um, the, what, you'll, what we're doing is uh, taking a BEC machine, and I think we're going to work jointly with the University of Colorado, where some of this fundamental work was done as well, and be able to put a BEC machine on the cloud that you could, and this will be over the course of the next, starting in the next couple of three months, depending on how well things move in spite of us all being quarantined one way or another. Um, so you'll start seeing it soon. And our hope is that by the early fall, we'll have a pretty functional BEC machine. You'll be able to submit like the idea of jobs to it. You'll be able to control a few of the knobs of the BEC machine and run experiments on it. So that's what we're working toward. We're hoping that we could interest someone like the National Science Foundation or potentially others to put up, you know, some money for, for uh, people to be able to run big experiments or longer experiments on it than we could, than we could support by just doing it ourselves. But that's, that's for the future. So, so think of it as uh, a uh, sort of an international resource of a BEC or quantum matter machine on the cloud. And you'll be able to run, um, uh, you know, smallish, uh, create <laughs> uh, small jobs, if you will, in the computer sense. And then if you have lots and lots of stuff to run, we need to figure out a way to be able to support it doing that. But that's the idea. Multi-use uh, facility that we'll put up probably with the University of Colorado, and you would see it coming pretty soon. And okay. we'd also say that, that the user interface will probably be a little... You know, it's really for friendly users at the start, uh, and then it'll get more robust as we go along. But it'll be a great way for people to learn about this, this new type of quantum matter. Great. Um, so here's another one. Can you talk about the size, weight, and power characteristics of the entire device, quantum core, plus all the enabling and supporting technology? Um, I can in uh, general terms. So, and let me give you uh, sort of two examples of it. So, one is if we were to build uh, <laughs> this quantum computer that we've uh, talked about, I could imagine that we would end up having that entire device with hundreds or thousands of qubits, and it would be packaged in like a three foot by three foot by three foot or a meter by a meter by a meter uh, cube. 
Um, and uh, along with it would be a couple of racks of traditional computing equipment to interface it to other computers in the network and to control it and that sort of thing. Um, doesn't require any special cooling and uh, probably runs on less than 10 kilowatts of power. When we talk about these early, so that's, that's the quantum computing side. And if we talk about a quantum positioning system device, you could imagine that it would, these will be the prototype devices, but they might fit in the volume of one foot by one foot by one foot, or maybe a little bit less than that and be in a package of that size. So they won't, again, won't be ready for your car, but they could go on larger, you know, larger vehicles like ships um, or some planes. And, you know, so maybe that size. And again, this, this would be early uh, devices. And, uh, you know, so sort of of that size, not use very much power at all and, uh, and be rugged. So that at least hopefully gives you some idea of the scale. Okay, and here's a temperature um, question. So it reads, temp achieved is micro Kelvin. Nice to know the nano Kelvin temp. What temp achieved or claimed there in Cal? Oh, um, you know, I don't have the, uh, the exact, let me back up here a little bit if I can. I don't have the exact number in my head, but if you go to the um, uh, JPL website, you'll find a Cold Atom Laboratory there, and they'll talk about it. And it's in the, I, I might have this mixed up, but I think it's in the 50-ish nanokelvin range, something like that. But the actual, uh, there are articles there about what they were able to achieve in microgravity. And as you can imagine, you can achieve lower temperatures in a microgravity environment than you can uh, on the Earth um, because we don't have, you don't have to fight so much sort of to keep, even though these are atoms, uh, they still are attracted uh, by gravity. So the less gravity, the better and the colder they can often be. So I'm sorry, I don't have the exact number in my head, but go to JPL website and look up Cal. Okay, I think that that will do it for right now. Um, and as Bo had indicated, we do have um, a specific BEC uh, webinar lined up that will be in the beginning of May and that the next one, which you all will get an invite to, will be presented by our CTO, um, Dana Anderson, and we'll be covering a little bit more of the little deeper dive into the actual technology. So we thank you all for attending and especially having so many countries represented and we hope everyone is staying healthy as well as um, not too bored in your isolation, keeping yourselves busy um, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks for um, stopping by. Yeah, and thanks everybody. Be well and uh, send us emails or calls or whatever if we can answer more questions and thanks so much for staying with us. Again, be well. And again, that email is info at coldquanta.com.